So guys, uh, ah, first of all, I was going to do this thing. We don't have a singing bowl, or I forgot, I forgot my singing bowl, I should say. So I'm just going to say the words ding, and I'm going to say the words ding three times. I want you to imagine that I'm striking a singing bowl melodically. Uh, I'd just like you to take a moment to plant your feet on the floor. And we're going to do something called intention and motivation, which is a little bit of a Buddhisty thing, but actually it's a common sense thing. We're about to do something, about to spend 90 minutes going on a little journey together. So before we go on the journey, it makes sense to think, where are we going and why do we want to go there? Where are we going is our intention. So as, our group, as, as a group, our intention might be to explore the practices of lucid dreaming and dream yoga. But what's your motivation? Why are you here? Why aren't you down the pub? Why aren't you at the five rhythms that I usually go to on a Thursday night? Why aren't you somewhere else? Why, why are you here? So I'm just going to ask you to become aware of your breath and then just drop that question into your mind, why are you here? So we can just sit. Eyes open or closed, either is fine. Breathing through the nose or mouth, either is fine. Just sitting. Just breathing. You've been breathing since you woke up this morning, and long before that too. But how many breaths have you been aware of since you woke up this morning? Take time now just to become aware of three inhalations and exhalations at your own pace. And then just allowing the breath to return to its natural rhythm. And then the state of slightly more settled mind. I want you to ask yourself a question. I want you to ask yourself, why am I here? Why did I come to this talk tonight? And maybe an answer came, maybe not. The important thing is that we ask the question. And then as a group, we can set a group motivation and intention to explore these practices with an open heart and an open mind, with the motivation that we might be more awake, more aware, and more kind for the benefit of all beings. Ding, ding. So we haven't got very long, we've got like an hour and a half. Um, what I want to do is explore what lucid dreaming is and how it works from the Western, oh, hey man, uh, from the Western scientific, and I mean, this is going to happen a lot, isn't it? I've seen lots of people I vaguely know. Um, from the Western scientific and um, Western psychological points of view. Then I want to touch on lucid dreaming on the spiritual path, primarily within the Tibetan dream yoga tradition, but also show you how this can actually be used for any spiritual path. You can go into the lucid dream and commune with God, commune with Jesus, just as much as you can go into the lucid dream and transform yourself into Chenrezi, the Buddha of compassion. The practices here aren't limited, aren't constricted by the Tibetan Buddhist framework. In fact, there's nothing in there that says we have to do them as Tibetan Buddhist practices. So I'll be exploring that too. Um, who here has had an experience of being in a dream, and while they're dreaming, they think, hang on, this is all a dream. Has anyone ever had that experience? Show of hands. Okay. Okay, so maybe just over half the room, great. For those who haven't had that experience, or maybe for those who have as well, have you ever had a nightmare where in the nightmare, you've gone, I've got to wake up, I've got to wake up. Anyone ever had that? Show of hands. Okay, perfect. That was also a lucid dream. The moment you recognized there was a place to wake up to was the moment reflective awareness 
within the REM dream state was engaged. So often, people's first experience of lucidity is through nightmares. And um, my new book, Dreaming Through Darkness, as you can imagine, has got a, uh, a couple of chunky chapters on nightmares and how we can use the darker aspects of the shadows to help fuel lucidity. Just as a little footnote here, uh, if anyone regularly has those nightmares where they know they're dreaming in the nightmare, I would advise you not to wake up. Every time you wake yourself from a nightmare, the nightmare just goes, see you next week. And that's why nightmares recur so often compared to other dreams. If you are lucky enough to become fully lucid, fully aware within a nightmare, do not wake yourself up. Try, if you can, to stay within the dream in the knowledge that I'm not really in a life-threatening situation, I am dreaming I'm in a life-threatening situation. That change of perspective is quite a revolutionary one to have within the dream and moves us from feeling that we're in a horror movie where our life is in danger to watching a horror movie where we can enjoy the frights that the internal director offers us. So, hopefully now, you kind of get what a lucid dream is. A lucid dream can be defined as a dream in which you're actively aware of the fact you're dreaming as the dream is happening. So it's not just a really vivid dream. Um, but you'd be excused for thinking that because we've got a problem with terms here. Lucid, in the English language, connotes clarity. It connotes clear seeing. It connotes vividness. But a lucid dream is not just a really vivid dream. A lucid dream is specifically a dream where you are fully conscious within the dream. So I like to refer to this as the aha moment. You're in the dream and you have an aha, this is all a dream moment. Once you have this aha moment, there are direct neural correlates. This means from a Western scientific point of view, we can put you in a brain scanner and we can see, aha, they're lucid dreaming because a certain part of the brain switches on. That part of the brain is called the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. If you know what that is, please inform me, I don't. Um, but it's, it's somewhere here and it's linked to self-assessment and a sense of agency. So we know there is actually a moment where part of the brain switches on that is usually not switched on during normal, non-lucid dreaming. So a lucid dream, you know you're dreaming. Once you know you're dreaming, you can reflect on the outside world. So you can be in your dream, oh, I'm dreaming, right. Uh, okay, so my body's asleep in bed. Uh, it's probably about 4 a.m. Uh, I'm going to email Charlie when I wake up from this and tell him I've had my first lucid dream, and please do, that's always fun. And you can also decide what to do. You can think, oh, I'm going to try that thing he talked about in the talk, about saying Buddhist mantras in the lucid dream, or, you know what, I'm just going to fly about and have sex with movie stars. Either or, it's totally up to you. And I have no judgment on that. You know, I taught myself to lucid dream at 16, way before I got into Dharma stuff. So the first two years, 16 to 18, we were talking about skateboarding. It was just sex and skateboarding, which are my two favorite things at 16. Uh, one of which I was doing much more than the other. I'll let you decide which one. So I used to become lucid. Oh, I know I'm dreaming. Right, okay, I want skateboarding. Be really good on the ramps and then kind of call out for sexy girls to appear and stuff like that. I was doing that for like two years. And then I got into Dharma. I got into kind of Buddhist stuff around 18, 19. And they started talking about this word dream yoga. I thought it was kind of doing asanas in your sleep or stretching before bed or something. I said, what's dream yoga? And I remember this monk said, oh, dream yoga, a series of practices found within Tibetan Buddhism that have lucid dream training at their core. We use it to explore the nature of reality. We use it to train for the moment of our death. And we use it to do our spiritual practice in our sleep. And I said to the monk, oh, right, because I, I can do lucid dreaming. And he said, oh, right, and, and what do you use your lucid dreams for? It's like skateboarding, a lot of skateboarding. <laughs> no. And then the penny dropped, and I thought, oh, wow, you know, this is a proper thing. So please don't get stuck in that quagmire of sex and skateboarding that I did. You know, I went through that so you don't have to. Um, please, in your first lucid dreams, really use it for benefit. Because I truly believe lucid dreaming is one of the most powerful psychological, psychological interventions and healing modalities available today. And the great thing about it is, firstly, you do it in bed, which is amazing, a spiritual practice you get to do in your sleep, that's so cool. Uh, and secondly, there's no guru to worship. There's no religion to be part of, there's no cult to give 10% of your annual income to. You learn the practices, you go to sleep, you have the experience. That is very self-empowering. How do I know if it's worked? I go in the lucid dream, I say these mantras, I go in the lucid dream, I do this physical healing, how do I know if it works? You see how you feel the next day. 
You don't need to check in with anyone. You don't need to see what level you're at. You go in the lucid dream, you heal your knee. The next day, your knee feels better. The lucid dream healing worked. You go into the lucid dream, you recite mantras of compassion, you merge your mind with an essence of compassion, symbolic essence, whether it's Jesus or Chenrezig Buddha, you wake up feeling really, really good. You know it worked. That's what I love about lucid dreaming. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. I feel a bit like a gospel preacher sometimes about lucid dreaming. I'm like, yeah. Let's get back to basics. Right, so we know what lucid dreaming is. Um, how does it work? We kind of mentioned this, scientifically. Um, when you're dreaming, usually the back part of the brain is activated, front part of the brain is deactivated. In a lucid dream, the front part of the brain, prefrontal regions, become activated while you're dreaming. So scientifically, lucid dreaming is classed as a hybrid state of consciousness in which uh, the centers of self-perception are engaged at the same time as the brain is dreaming. Basically, you know you're dreaming. Um, here's the cool thing. Once those front parts of the brain switch on, a phenomenon called neuroplasticity becomes engaged. I'm sure you've heard of this. This is the um, habit of the brain to rewire itself in favor of a newly learned skill based on repetitious um, engagement of certain brain networks. Basically, if you play piano a lot, Certain brain regions to do with playing the piano, I don't know what they are, let's say it's hand-to-eye coordination, will become denser because you use them more than someone who doesn't play piano. Now, in a non-lucid dream, when that front part of the brain isn't engaged, if you spend the whole night dreaming about football, maybe the next day you'll feel, oh, I really want to play football, but you probably won't have got any better at playing football. However, once you get lucid, that front part of the brain switches on, neuroplasticity becomes engaged. This means that once you get lucid, if you decide to spend your lucid dreams shooting penalties, one after the other, one after the other, one after the other, we can test you the next day, and you will probably have got better at shooting penalties. This is insane. They did these studies at Frankfurt University. It sounds like something from sci-fi, but it's science fact. Teach these athletes to lucid dream. Months for these athletes to get a stabilized level of lucid dreaming. And then of all the things they could do, communing with their higher self, doing their meditation, their dream, exploring the empty nature and pure potentiality of their own mind, they're forced to do squats. So these guys have to get lucid, and then in their lucid dream, they go, all right, what did I want to do? Squats. So obviously, they're like asleep in bed, right? But in their dream, they're practicing squats. Then the next day, they test them, they put them in brain scanners, do all these charts, stuff. Um, anyway, they found out they could do more squats. It wasn't that they were increasing their muscle mass in the dream, but that the dream was strengthening these neural pathways which said, I find squats easy. So the next day they could do more squats. The same goes for press-ups and all this kind of stuff. Um, so that's pretty cool. You can do press-ups in your lucid dreams and do more press-ups in the waking state. But what does it really mean? It means what you do in your lucid dreams is not just like dreaming it, it's like doing it. What you do in your lucid dreams is not like dreaming it, it's like doing it. So let's not practice squats. Let's practice compassion. Let's practice our meditation. Let's practice being the person we know we could be if we were free of the shadow of fear that stops us being that person. It's said from a Buddhist point of view, you are closer to your innate, fully enlightened state an expression of full Buddha nature in the lucid dream than you are in the waking state. In the lucid dream, you are closer to your fully enlightened nature than you are in the waking state. Why? Because in the lucid dream, you know it's all projection. Whereas right now, you think it's real. So the lucid dream state is used for this preparation for spiritual practice, or not for spiritual practice, preparation for spiritual emergence. It's said the lucid dream state within Tibetan Buddhism is like a laboratory of enlightened action, allowing you to engage spiritual practices with much greater ease than in the waking state. Um, for example, any Buddhist practitioners in here who might do certain um, sadhanas where you like visualize a Buddha above your head, and then maybe in certain uh, Buddhist ceremonies, you visualize yourself in the form of a certain Buddha. Now, if you do that in a lucid dream, visualization manifests into reality. 
because the lucid dream itself is a huge visualization. So if in the lucid dream you visualize a Buddha above your head, and in the lucid dream you visualize yourself in the form of a Buddha, you may well look down and see your dream form turned into a Buddha. That can be a very, very powerful experience. From a psychological point of view, this could be referred to as unlocking the archetype. The archetype being universally existing uh, symbolic representations of aspects of your own psychology. Archetypes like the inner child, archetypes like the wise man, archetypes like the trickster, the fool, the mother, the whore. Within the lucid dream, you can <coughs> enter into these archetypes and unlock the energy within them. So what's lucid dreaming? How does it work? Oh, this is important. Is it control? So once you get lucid and you go, oh, I'm lucid, right, I want to practice my skateboarding. Or you say, oh, let's do the flying through the sky one, easier. Um, I'm lucid and I want to fly through the sky. Has anyone ever flown in a lucid dream before? Yeah, best way to get around. Why would you walk in a lucid dream? <laughs> I'm, I'm lucid, I'm, I'm walking, I'm like, oh, I forgot I'm doing. <laughs> no. This is cool, right? Uh, oh, how do you guys fly in your lucid dreams? It's Superman or swimming? Like swimming? Swimming, okay, yeah. It's usually Superman's the first one, just boom, and then the swimming one, swimming through the air, okay. So whatever method you do, whether it's the air swim or whether it's the Superman thing, um, you might think that you're controlling the dream. You are controlling your subjective experience of the dream that is not the same as controlling the dream itself. If I control my experience of, the dream, of, of flying through the sky, so I'm like, oh, Charlie's wrong, I'm flying through the sky, I'm totally controlling everything here, right? What is controlling the people walking in and out of the shops that you're flying over? What is controlling the trees that go as you zoom past them like Superman? You didn't control that bit. So although you can have a level of subjective control over the dream, the macrocosm of the dream is not under your control. Now, this is a problem with semantics here. But there is a problem with the word control. When we look at the word control, a few levels down and we get to dominance, we get to subjugation, we get to beating something into submission. We don't want to control the dream. We want to befriend the dream. If you can befriend the awesome power of the unconscious mind, you will have more control than you ever thought possible. So if you really do want control over the dream, don't try and force it. Try and make such good friends with the dreaming mind that it wants to do whatever you want to happen. With this level of friendship, you can get to the point where you can ask for pretty much anything in the dream and it will manifest. But that's not because you've kind of mastered and dominated the dream. It's because you've encompassed this sense of friendship to such a high degree that the dream is willing to engage whatever you want to happen. The image for this is the sailor in the sea. My friend Robert Wagner definitely has to take credit for this. He says, just as no sailor controls the sea, so does no lucid dreamer control the dream. It would be an arrogant sailor to believe they control the awesome power of the ocean. So too, it would be an arrogant lucid dreamer to believe they control the awesome power of the unconscious mind. You know that kind of iceberg theory, right? Very outdated, but quite a nice image. Iceberg theory of the mind. Top 10% above the surface conscious, bottom 90% below the surface, uh, like 90% unconscious. Modern day neuroscience says that well, it was too conservative. It's more like 5% conscious, 95% unconscious. <laughs> so to think that we can control that 95% of our potentiality through the lucid dream is incorrect. But imagine if you can harness 95% of your mental capacity. Imagine if you can tune in to 95% more mental energy than you currently have now. Things get very, very interesting very, very quickly once that starts to happen. And not just in your waking life. That's not just in your dream life, but in your waking life too. So this is my kind of Western psychological page. And then we'll do the Western stuff, uh, the um, Buddhist -y stuff. The benefits of lucid dreaming from a Western psychological point of view, um, well, the one with the most research are probably training and rehearsal and nightmares. So the training and rehearsal one, this is the stuff I told you from um, Frankfurt University and Heidelberg University doing the studies on athletes and stuff, 
showing that you can go into the lucid dream and train your athletic discipline. You actually get better at it in the waking state. Um, nightmare cessation, a lot of stuff on this. Um, working with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Lucid dreaming seems to be one of the most powerful and positive interventions that we can make um, around post-traumatic stress nightmares. And last year I did, we think it was the first in the UK, um, almost certain of it, but who knows. Um, first retreat, mindfulness retreat with uh, armed forces veterans where we included lucid dreaming to try and work with their nightmares. Uh, and we had some really beautiful experiences. You know, one guy hadn't slept through the night for like five years. And the next day in our dream circle, this guy was in, you know, almost kind of tears of joy. Not because he'd had a lucid dream, but because he slept through the night for the first time in four or five years. And that was just because he knew the possibility of being able to harness nightmares. And knowing that nightmares aren't a bad thing. Nightmares are often a sign of a healing mind. A nightmare is simply a dream that is shouting. It's shouting, Oi! Deal with this! Childhood trauma! Or, Oi! Deal with this! You almost got hit, hit by a car last week! Deal with this! Deal with this! It's yelling because it wants to help us, not because it wants to harm us. But a lot of studies into this are uh, showing that if you can have the lucid dream where you know, OK, I'm not back in Iraq, I'm dreaming I'm back in Iraq, sometimes PTSD nightmares are kind of like a stuck record so if you can get lucid in that stuck record of being back in Iraq, back in Iraq, back in Iraq, it's like you pick up the needle and put it down on another track. So in some cases, just one lucid dream has been enough to unlock the repetition, uh, the repetitious cycle of PTSD nightmares. So a lot of research on that. So if you do know anyone suffering from nightmares or if you suffer from nightmares yourself, lucid dreaming is a very, very powerful tool for that. Um, and again, my new book's got, got a lot on this. I'm very interested in this. Um, this is cool, asking big questions. The unconscious mind, from a Western point of view, is like a huge hard drive of experience. We know from neuroscientific studies, uh, with using hypnosis actually, um, that people can recall pre-verbal memories, like the color of the wallpaper uh, on their wall when they were a baby. Uh, so they use this study to prove, oh, the unconscious mind seems to store everything. Every book you've ever read, Every spiritual teaching you've ever heard, every film you've ever seen, every conversation you've ever had is stored in this huge library of knowledge that we call the unconscious. In a lucid dream, you get the keys to the library. Hmm. There's the librarian. So I've had uh, the keys to the library for like almost 15 years. I still have no idea where 90% of the books are in the library. But a couple of, aspect, a couple of areas of the library I've, I've had a good look at. And it is a fascinating experience to explore the inside of your own mind, to be able to go back to past memory, to be able to go to traumatic events and heal them in the same way as you would work with a therapist. You can go in there yourself and start to make interventions. Um, you can also ask questions. Let's say you are worried about what career path to take and you're using your conscious mind and you're like, okay, what should I do? Should I take the job? 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 If you go into a lucid dream state and you ask the question, what career path should I take? It is not the limited 5 or 10% conscious mind that is asking you. It's not the mind that is full of your self-doubt, that is full of your limitations, that is full of your I am program. It is that 90% of you that remembers every book you've ever read, every spiritual teaching you've ever heard, every conversation you've ever had. It has access to huge amounts of data. So the answers it can give you, or the advice that your dreaming mind can give you, is often way beyond the scope of your conscious mind. So you can go into the lucid dream and literally say things like, what career path should I take? Or um, uh, how, can I be of greatest, uh, how can I be of highest benefit? Uh, that was a funny one. There was a woman, she, she was actually looking for career advice. And I said, oh, I'm not sure about asking the dream what career path I should take. Why don't you try, um, how can I be of greatest benefit? And she got lucid. Oh, I'm lucid, right. What did Charlie say to you? Oh, cool. How can I be of greatest benefit? And everything in the dream turned to love. She said literally the word love started coming up like helium balloons from the floor. And then the ground started flashing and love, 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 love. And she said, okay, that's great. How can I be of greatest benefit? Be pure love, but I still don't know what job to take. But you can be specific. 
when I, uh, as some of you know, I didn't start doing this. You know, I spent my 20s in a kind of moderately successful hip hop crew uh, with a group of break dancers, graffiti artists, rappers. I was the spoken word guy. I used to love like spoken word poetry and rap and stuff like that. And um, then when I started doing the teaching stuff, I had this weird time where like was for the first two or three years where I wasn't making any money from the lucid dreaming stuff. So I had to keep my old job, but I was like, at the weekends doing lucid dreaming workshops, then during the weeks doing like hip hop parties and stuff like that. And I was getting a bit of anxiety around this, you know, what am I supposed to do with my life? So I got lucid and I called out to the dream, what career path should I take? Should I do throwdown, which is the name of the hip hop crew, uh, or should I be a lucid dreaming teacher? I literally call that out to the dream. And the dream responds, this is the cool thing about the lucid dream. I mean, if this sounds like the Matrix or Vanilla Sky or something, yes, it is very much like that. The dream responded, the dream characters entered the dream, uh, and I said to them, what career path should I take? And the first one said, you must be a lucid dreaming teacher, this is how you can truly benefit people. And I was like, oh wow, what a cool answer. And I looked to my left, and there's this dude who looks exactly like I did when I was 17. He's got a long ponytail, he's got his top off, and he got a bottle of vodka. And I was like, oh, that's my inner hedonist. So I go to my inner hedonist, I'm like, dude, what should I, should I do the lucid dream? He goes, no man, do throw down, throw down rocks. And he gives me the bottle of vodka. And I thought, okay, there are two opinions there from the inside of my mind. One, the inner hedonist, one, the kind of wise man. You decide what to take. So you can get this kind of advice from the inside of your mind, which is, apart from being incredibly fascinating, incredibly beneficial to know that you share your headspace with a genius, we just so rarely listen to its advice. And if you were to meet the part of you that remembered every book you've ever read, every spiritual teaching you've ever had, its wisdom might seem so profound that you dare not admit it was you. So you often get people saying, oh, but no, it wasn't me. I met God in the lucid dream. It gave me this profound wisdom. And I think, Maybe. There is option one, it was God, absolutely. Option two, it was your inner wisdom that was so profound, it felt like it was separate from you. Whatever. But the point is, you can go in there and you can commune with that wisdom, whether it's inner or outer wisdom. Um, and weirdest of all is, well, not, maybe not weirdest of all, but healing. Um, psychological healing, things like, uh, remember the brain networks thing? So let's say you're scared of spiders, go into a lucid dream, a bit like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, go into the lucid dream, interact with a spider. Don't yell out spiders now, as one guy did in lucid dream and everything turned to spiders. Um, be like, okay, I'm lucid, right, I'm scared of spiders, what do I want to do? I'm gonna, a, a tiny friendly spider appear now, and then like tiny friendly spider, let it walk on your arm, this is gonna freak you out, you will feel everything. You know that thing, pinch yourself to see if you're dreaming? In a lucid dream, that's bullshit. You pinch yourself, you'll feel pain. In fact, pinch yourself in a lucid dream because you're like, how am I feeling pain? I'm asleep in bed, but I'm creating the illusion of pain. That will change your perception of pain forever. So do pinch yourself in a dream. Uh, anyway, so you could interact with a spider, uh, letting the spider crawl up your arm. Now remember, your brain thinks you're awake. It doesn't think you're dreaming once you become lucid, once the prefrontal cortex becomes engaged. So your brain's going, oh, I'm no longer scared of spiders? Okay, right, I'll lay down new neural pathway, a pathway saying I'm no longer scared of spiders. You see how it works. This can work with phobia, this can work with uh, other types of psychological healing. That's been proven. What hasn't been proven, although I know it's true, and so do other people, is the ability to heal yourself physically in the lucid dream. Um, so you may have heard of things like visualized healing, in fact, there's something on the UK cancer website where it used to be a version, a type of visualized healing was actually available in the NHS. Uh, I think it's called the Simiton Method or S Smith's Simiton Method, I think. Ah, perfect, great. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it is a uh, uh, visualization practice where you imagine colored light entering the body and surrounding the point of inflammation. Let's say you've hurt your elbow. So you imagine colored light around the elbow, and this has been shown at least to relax the patient enough for their uh, um, own immune system to be working at an optimized level, or in some cases actually uh, have a healing effect, whether it's the placebo or not. Uh, it's limited though, because those people who couldn't, or thought they couldn't visualize, found the technique to be lacking. A lucid dream is a 100% visualization. You can't get more of a visualization than a lucid dream, the whole thing's one. So if you engage visualized healing within the lucid dream, 
it can work with a far greater efficacy than in the waking state. So let's say you've hurt your knee, as I did a couple of years ago, uh, tore a ligament in the knee, I got lucid, uh, really badly, by the way. In fact, I woke because the pain was so bad I, I, I was going to puke, so I had to crawl to the bathroom to puke, and I came back fainted, got myself back into bed, and then had the lucid dream. So I knew it was bad when I had it. So I got lucid, and I was like, all right, I know what I'm doing, I need to work on my knee. So I, in the lucid dream, I'm asleep in bed, but in the lucid dream, I go, oh, right, I want to heal my knee. So I put my dream hands on my dream knee, not in real life, in the dream. And I go, my knee is healed of all non-beneficial disease. You know, like good bacteria, bad bacteria. I, I would always say non-beneficial disease. Maybe some disease is beneficial. Maybe it's karmic. Maybe I need to go through it. But I would say, uh, my, um, my knee is healed of all non-beneficial disease. My immune system is boosted. My knee is healed. My immune system is boosted. As I'm saying this, all this light is coming out of my hands, like healing light. Again, it's just the mind. It's just projection, right? However, it is very realistic projection. So the placebo, meth the placebo effect within a lucid dream is like placebo max. It's like placebo times 100. So when I wake up, uh, I think, oh my god, my knee's going to be healed, it's amazing. No, it was totally swollen and totally still bad. But the knee healed very quickly. Within like a couple of days, I was walking again, which is pretty strange for knee injuries. So I'm not saying lucid dreaming can cure you of injuries, but it definitely can speed up the recovery and healing process. Um, just the placebo? Yeah, probably. But so what? I used to wear glasses, you'll see in some of my videos. I did the placebo three times in a lucid dream, and I don't wear my glasses. Maybe, as my brother said, oh, just because you believe in lucid dreaming so much, you believed your way out of wearing glasses. I'm like, well, yes, maybe, but I don't wear glasses anymore, dude, so that's great. Again, this isn't scientifically verified. Uh, the scientists think, uh, they think it might be like a level of deep hypnosis that's leading to the physical healing, uh, or the most popular view is the placebo effect. It's a very powerful version of the placebo effect. Um, but anyway, give it a try. Anything you hear me say today which you think is bullshit, here's the cool thing. Firstly, call me on my bullshit. It's great practice uh, for me. I mean, literally practice for me responding to questions. But also, call me on my bullshit by trying it. Go into your lucid dream and interact with a spider and see if you're less scared of them the next day. Go into your lucid dream and see if you can heal an ailment and tell me whether it works, whether it doesn't. You know, really try this stuff. Really experiment with this stuff. It's not theoretical. It's practical. Really, we shouldn't even be talking. We should be sleeping. Why are we having a talk about lucid dreaming? We should have a sleepover, right? It's crazy talking about it. It's like talking about the taste of chocolate. I need to take you to the chocolate factory. That means like 25 beds, which probably wouldn't fit. But I do run these sleepover retreats, actually, uh, where you do exactly that. Um, we have up to 40 people. Um, first half of the night, you sleep in your own room, get your deep sleep, your delta wave. Then at 3.30 in the morning, if you want, I don't wake you up, but if you want, um, you then set your alarm and you move to a sacred sleeping area. So we have a second bed number two. You have two beds. One you sleep in for the first half of the night. Second one is like a camping setup um, in a big shrine room. And then every 90 minutes, I wake you up, give you a certain meditation to do. You drop back to sleep. 90 minutes later, wake you up, do a certain meditation, drop back to sleep. A theory on, this is Tibetan method actually, uh, of breaking the night up into several sections. Um, theory is you fall asleep once, wake up once in the morning, one chance to do the practice. Some crazy guy wakes you four times, you've just quadrupled your chances of success. Let's give you a few things now, because you're right, this is too tempting. First thing you can do for tonight is uh, set your intention to remember your dreams. Lucid dreaming is about becoming conscious of the fact you're dreaming as the dream is happening. So the first thing we need to do is to become more conscious of our dreams. So this means setting an intention to remember our dreams and regularly keeping a dream diary. The act of writing something down solidifies memory. So what we want to do is really get to know the landscape of our own dreams. After a couple of weeks of writing a dream diary, you'll start to see, oh, I often dream of my dead grandmother. Or, oh, I often dream of that beach we used to go to as a kid. Or, I often dream about, uh, what's my, my, oh, talking, like baby talking animals, like baby talking pandas and stuff like that. You'll start to see these patterns emerge. And then once you've seen the patterns, before bed, you say, like I'm doing right now, right, Charlie, next time you see a talking baby animal, know that you're dreaming. Talking baby animal equals dreaming. Talking baby animal equals dreaming. I set this strong lucidity trigger. And then I hope I dream of talking baby animals. Now, a new technique I've tried is I'm trying to intentionally dream about talking baby animals. 
So I'm going onto YouTube and trying to, you know those cats that sound like they're talking a little bit? And my new method, I don't know if this is fresh, fresh technique. Uh, my, my theory is, if I watch like lol cat things before bed, I'm likely to dream about them. And when I see the talking cat, the trigger will be engaged and I'll get lucid. But get back to me on that. I don't know if it works, but I'm trying that one out at the moment. But this is basically how it works. First thing, set your intention to remember your dreams. Keep your dream diary. Start spotting patterns. Once you see the patterns, you start creating these lucidity triggers. Like, you know, seeing my dead grandmother, the trigger, that's when I'm going to be dreaming. Uh, talking animals, create the trigger, that's when I'm going to be dreaming. And then when you next dream about that thing, the trigger will be engaged, hopefully, and you'll become lucid. That's kind of the basic few techniques. I was just wondering, and I'm sure there's a lot of people practicing lucid dreaming already, but why hasn't it entered like, the mainstream kind of like, therapy? Sort of mm. Because it's not easy. Yeah, when I wrote my second book, I had a bit in it where I had this whole almost kind of conspiracy theory thing. Why isn't this in mainstream? Why is it being suppressed? Is it that the mainstream uh, medicine makers don't want us to know about the placebo of loose dreaming? And luckily, my, my teacher, uh, Rob Nairn, he always I, he does an edit on all my books before they go to print, and he just sends them back covered in red. They're saying, do you even know what that means? This is ridiculous. Definitely not. He just smashes my ego. And he put in that, he went ridiculous. The reason why it's not mainstream is because it's difficult to do. And I thought, okay, I served. Um, so I think that's true. It's, I know in London of three psychotherapists who are using lucid dreaming with patients. It's not that they've taught their patients a lucid dream. It's a, in, the series of, in the process of therapy, they found out their patients are lucid dreamers. The therapists have done courses with me, so know the potential, and have then gone, oh, well, in your next lucid dream, why don't you try to call out for your inner child, the symbolic representation of your childhood? And because you had a traumatic childhood, when it arrives, it may be in wounded form, and you can then embrace it. Because if this is a symbol of flight, this is a symbol of love and acceptance. So they're starting to work with directing, not teaching their clients how to lucid dream, but offering them teachings on how to use the lucid dreams for therapeutic benefit. So I think there's more of that happening. Um, but yeah, it just takes too long to learn, I think, to be kind of mainstream, or too long to stabilize. So until we get to kind of like that movie Inception, you know, where they, I don't know what it is, but some device that they kind of boom, and then they all go into the lucid dream. Until we get to that stage, which I'm not sure we want to get to, I don't think it's going to be in the mainstream. Um, but having said that, I don't think lucid dreaming is any, di any more difficult than any other form of yoga, right? Like, say you learn like a new form of, of, of yoga, right? What's the yoga you guys do here? Yantra yoga, right? So, you, okay, you're not going to expect to like have nailed yantra yoga in a month. It's going to take years to get to a point where you know all the postures, where you can move from one to another, flow. But we don't give up on yantra yoga because we haven't nailed it in a month. But people think with lucid dreaming, like, oh, I should have nailed this in a month. Oh, I can't do it. Everyone can lucid dream. I'm yet to find someone who can't do it. Um, but I found a lot of people who give up before they stabilize the practice because it's just too difficult. Or they, they believe it to be too difficult. Um, but also, it's a bit like, you know, it's like trying to teach yourself to dance from a book. It's possible, but if you want to learn to dance, you'd come to a dance class. You know, so it's the lack of workshops, it's the lack of retreats. There aren't many people doing the kind of workshops and retreats uh, that me and a few other people are doing. So once you've learned it, how easy is it to do it? Like, how often do you lucid dream? How easy is it once you've Totally depends. Sometimes I have five lucid dreams a night, sometimes five a month. Totally depends. I'm not a natural lucid dreamer, which is why I think I'm, I'm quite good at teaching it because I know the pain of the drought. I know the pain of, oh my God, why aren't I lucid dreaming? I'm trying everything, it's not happening. Um, whereas my fiance, she's a natural. So she's on, she has about two or three lucid dreams a week without doing much practice. So if you're a natural, you'll be hitting that level. Um, if you're a practitioner like me, you might be having one or two lucid dreams a week, but it's because you're doing the practice. Then when you go and retreat, if you can be doing the practice every night, you can get lucid every night. Um, so if you're living in, the everyday world, like for me, maybe there are only two nights a week when I can actually do the practices, wake up at four, do this, do that, other times I'm traveling, teaching. When we do the four-day retreats and I've got four nights, then we can be getting lucid every night, but it totally depends, totally depends. And it's not really about the amount of lucid dreams you have, it's about the quality. There's a woman in my new book who had this amazing lucid dream, um, but she never had another. She had one lucid dream and it was huge. She she had some, just the quick 
story on it. She, uh, some abuse happened to her when she was seven years old. She went into the lucid dream and she called out to meet her seven-year-old self, the psychological representation of her at seven years old, to embrace her and tell her it wasn't your fault because she still carried guilt that somehow she deserved it or it was her fault. Um, interestingly, she got lucid and the dream blocked it. The dream has an intelligence. It knows what you're ready for and what you're not. So she called out seven-year-old self, come to me, the dream blocks it. She calls out again, nothing happens. Then a door appears. And on the door, there's a sign with the word caution. And look at that symbolism, isn't that cool? So she thought, oh, okay, right. The dream said, stuff is behind this door. Be careful if you enter it. And she thought, okay, I'll try it. If it's locked, I'll wake myself up. If it opens, I'll go through it. She goes through it, and there are several stories with the symbolic representation of the abuse. Uh, and she went into each room and started calling it affirmations. It's not your fault. I love you. You're free of this, blah, blah, blah. And she had this really strong healing experience. Um, but she never had a lucid dream again. The reason I know this is because I feature her in the new book, uh, anonymously, actually, uh, at her own choice. Uh, and I asked her, how have your lucid dreams been? She went, I haven't had a lucid dream since. So she had one lucid dream in her life, but it was life-changing. She integrated childhood abuse. Whereas I know other people who've had hundreds of lucid dreams, but are, you know, just messing about in them, flying about. Okay, now let's have a look at um, the Tibetan Buddhist view of lucid dreaming. So we have this term dream yoga, or in Tibetan it's milam. Milam means dream. Uh, so often milam is just the term used to describe the dream yoga practices. It is um, not incorrect to say that dream yoga uh, is the spiritual practice of lucid dreaming within the Tibetan tradition, but it's also very sloppy. Uh, dream yoga is way bigger than what in the West we call lucid dreaming. It actually includes what in the West we refer to as astral projection, outer body work, where you are not in the confines of your iceberg, you are in the ocean that surrounds the iceberg. This is astral projection, outer body work, and also something in the West that you could kind of translate as conscious sleeping, uh, the practice of being conscious within non-REM non dream states too, like the deep sleep states, which is a very powerful practice. Um, The main aims or benefits of dream yoga, so let's say these, these collection of lucid dreaming OBE practices within Tibetan Buddhism are preparation for the death and dying states, spiritual practice in your sleep, and exploring, we could say emptiness, but this is a word I don't really understand, so we can think the pure potentiality of the mind, the pure potentiality of all phenomena. <laughs> We're opening a big can of worms, we've got like half an hour left. Okay, um, I'm going to whiz through these, never whiz through death and dying and the bardo and this stuff, but we've only got half an hour left, so I'd rather plant the seeds than give you nothing. Um, death and dying, how the hell does lucid dreaming prepare you for death and dying? The crux of it is this, it is said that the process of falling asleep mirrors the process of dying or the process of dying mirrors the process of falling asleep. So every night when you fall asleep, you're getting what my teacher referred to as a trial run for the dying experience. There's a whole load of uh, quite complex stuff around the dissolution of the elements, certain elemental energies that dissolve one into the other as you fall asleep, and those things happen in exactly the same order when you die. So it's said that if you can master the art of falling asleep consciously, that sounds like a paradox, but it is possible to fall asleep Enter dream with no blackout, no lack of consciousness. It's not easy, but it's possible. Um, if you can master that, then it's said at the point of death, you may be able to die consciously. And to not lose your consciousness as you enter the most unconscious state for most people, dead, is said to be the highest achievement of the yogi. So there's a very strong link between the process of falling asleep and the process of dying. The after death state is sometimes referred to uh, by the term bardo, Bardo is a Tibetan word which um, actually means place in between. So it doesn't just mean the art of death state. This life is a bardo. It is the place in between birth and death. In the bardo of this life, the place in between, there are sub bardos the bardo of sleep and dream, the bardo of meditation, all these kind of things. But usually when you hear the term bardo, it refers to the interim period between the death of the physical form and the incarnation of the mind stream that inhabits it into the next life. Some aspects of the bardo, this after-death experience, are said to be dreamlike. It's not a dream, dreamlike. So, 
apparently, if you can train yourself to become fully lucid, fully conscious within your dreams, then you are training the potential capacity to become fully lucid in the, uh, in the dreamlike after-death bardo states. Basically, rather than going, aha, I'm dreaming, you go, aha, I'm dead. Sounds pretty far out, right? What do you do when you say, aha, I'm dead? Well, apparently, the moment of aha, I'm dead is said to have the highest spiritual potential. Because if you can recognize the after-death mind, you are recognizing the mind that is unhindered by both the limited sense of self, which dies at death, and the constraints of what in uh, Buddhism is called the gross corporeal form, so the constraints of the physical body. <coughs> so to recognize the mind without the constraints of the physical body, without the constraints of the ego mind, is to recognize your Buddha nature, your fully enlightened potential. So again, it said that recognition offers full spiritual enlightenment at the point of death. Do I know this is true? Absolutely not, no idea. Um, if it works, I'll come back as a little kid and find it. Hey, it worked. I made it through the bardo. I have no idea whether this stuff works. Um, but my teachers have no reason to lie to me. This is over a thousand years of tradition um, uh, proposing this. People who have made it through the bardo have then, in their next life, confirmed that that is the process that occurs. And also, uh, there are certain practitioners, usually female delogs, uh, who, in the West, we might call it flatlining, who intentionally lower their respiration level to a point which we would class as medical death. They enter into the after-death bardo state and come back and basically write a travelogue. Day one, this happens. Day two, I mean, this is totally far out. Uh, if you're interested, of course, the famous Tibetan Book of the Dead. Uh, but if you're a bit of a spiritual idiot like me, Tibetan Book of the Dead is way too heavy. I just can't work my way through it. So I would suggest a commentary on the Tibetan Book of the Dead, such as Living, Dreaming, Dying by my teacher, Rob Nairn, or, of course, the famous uh, Tibetan Book of Living and Dying by Sogyal Rinpoche. There are loads of other great books, I'm sure, too. Um, so, if you talk to a Tibetan Lama about lucid dreaming, they don't think of it like in the West. We think, oh, it's new agey, oh, lucid dreaming, yeah, I saw it on Facebook. For one, they'll probably be quite shocked that Westerners even know how to lucid dream. Because in Tibetan Buddhism, the dream yoga teachings, they aren't taught to like monks and nuns. It's not like part of the, the usual teachings. They're usually taught to kind of yogis in retreat or, or monastics who are doing long-term three or four-year retreat, or at least in my lineage, that's the case. Um, so they'll, you know, it, it's quite a thing, lucid dreaming within Tibetan Buddhism. It's not, to, it's not a kind of new agey thing. It's not, uh, it's not one of the basic practices. It's seen as one of, the, one of the higher practices because of this potential to train for the death and dying states and because of the potential of spiritual practice. In fact, the first Karmapa, so the Karmapa is the head of the particular lineage, the Buddhist lineage of which I'm part, the first Karmapa reached full spiritual enlightenment in a lucid dream. So obviously he was a very evolved spiritual being, but his actual light bulb moment of full, complete enlightenment came within a lucid dream. I mean, imagine falling asleep, pretty enlightened, having a lucid dream, doing a certain practice, and then waking up being like, I'm fully enlightened. Again, this is crazy. If this sounds like Harry Potter stuff, you know, it kind of does. It's, it's, it's very far out, but fascinating, fascinating stuff. Um, of course, the death stuff, I don't know if it's true. I know that I have far less fear of death, far less fear of death now than I did 10 years ago. Because if I were to die tonight, a little part of me would be saying, showtime, let's see if this stuff works. 90% of me would be crying, absolutely. But 10% would be going, okay, let's see, if, you know, let's see if this works. The spiritual practice stuff, you can try this yourself, absolutely. You do not need to be Buddhist for this. Another case study from my book, but it just because it's been on my mind a lot, um, a Christian lawyer called Anthony from America, who I was working with over email, so amazing. So he gets lucid, and rather than doing the dream yoga stuff, which would be once you're in the lucid dream, do your meditation practice, say the mantra of the certain deity of which you practice, visualize that deity in the sky in front of you, and then engage the self-visualization of the deity, basically transformation into the Buddha. He did his own version of this. This guy's full-on Christian. So he gets lucid, and he starts singing his Christian hymns in the dream. And he said, I don't know if this is right, but this is what happened. And he writes this amazing inscription. He gets lucid, starts singing his Christian hymns, and his heart in the dream opens up in this white light, goes out of his heart. Then the whole dream whites out, and he's floating in white light. And he's like, uh, I think, you know, was that right? And I was like, that was very, very right. <laughs> that could have even been an experience of what in Buddhism we refer to as the clear light. Who knows? Um, 
I wanted to test this theory myself. So in a lucid dream, rather than doing the Buddhist stuff, I called out to meet Jesus. And I got lucid and I went, Jesus Christ, come to me. I want to meet Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, I love you. And in the sky, in the lucid dreams, I flew up in the sky, like the clouds started to form my face. And I thought, oh, I'm going to be one of those guys who sees Jesus' face on a piece of toast. You know, it's going to be a bit, you know, not that, not what I was expecting. But then I'm focusing on the, on the clouds. And then suddenly, again, the dream whites out. Everything goes completely white. And again, because I'm a spiritual idiot, I have a moment literally of going, well, I don't know where Jesus is. <laughs> and then I thought, oh, this is Jesus. Pure white light. That's Jesus, not some dude with a beard. The energy of Jesus Christ, pure compassion, bodhisattva energy, is the white light, is the clear light. So I know this isn't limited to Buddhism. Why would it be? Of course it's not. So whatever your spiritual tradition is, I encourage you to practice it in the lucid dream. From a Buddhist point of view, to quote... Uh, to quote Michael Katz, quoting Namke Nobu Rinpoche, I believe, if I get this wrong, God, you're all this, lots of students here, um, that one moment of meditation within a lucid dream can be equal to a one-week meditation retreat in the waking state. I'm not sure how Rinpoche quantified those exact things, but we can say this, that what Rinpoche is saying there is that meditation in the lucid dream is very, very powerful. The dream yoga teachings say that the power of your mind within the lucid dream state is seven times as powerful. At, na at, at death, it's nine times as powerful. In the lucid dream, it's seven times as powerful. So in the lucid dream state, if you say a prayer, if you engage healing, if you do a certain spiritual practice, that is charged by seven times the power, the potential, than it is in the waking state. So it is a very, very powerful place to engage your spiritual practice. Again, test this. Go in there and do it. Do your spiritual practice. See what it's like. So this term kind of emptiness in Buddhism, a term used to describe the uh, inherent void nature of all phenomena, that what we think to be uh, dualistically existing reality is in fact a dreamlike illusion created by the collective projection of our mind. I have no idea what that means, because this seems pretty solid. It doesn't seem like a dream to me. You seem different, the lady with the skateboard, to me. But apparently we're all one and we're dreaming each other into existence. It's beyond me. However, in the lucid dream state, you can get a taste of this. My refuge lama, so my first teacher was a man called Akun Rinpoche, who was uh, murdered in Tibet almost three years ago now. Two, three years ago, maybe two years ago, or two or three years ago. And one of the last instructions he gave me when I saw him, um, I would go and have... In, in the Kagyu lineage, often it's the oral, trans, oral lineage. So you basically get instructions one-on-one -on -one from the teachers. And I went to him, and I'd done the last dream yoga practice he gave me, and it was quite esoteric. So I hoped he was going to give me another esoteric one. So I'm sitting at his feet, and I said, oh, Rinpoche, what shall I do in my next lucid dream? And I thought maybe he was going to say, oh, say this hundred-syllable mantra, or do this esoteric practice, tantra, all this kind of stuff. And he said three words, walk through wall. And I was like, what? He went, walk through wall. And I was like, walk through a wall? That's like child's play. I walk through. Of course, I didn't say that. I was like, oh, yes, okay, okay, walk through a wall. In my head, I was like, oh, that's rubbish. Walk through a wall, blah, blah, blah. I better do it. He's a fully enlightened being, all that kind of stuff. Blah, blah. So anyway, a couple of weeks later, I get lucid. Um, and I think, right, I'll try this. Walk through a wall. Get lucid. Oh, right, there's a wall. Go to walk through it. Bam, I hit my face. And I feel it. I feel the pain. I feel the solidity. I can't get through it. I'm thinking, that's nuts, because I know I'm dreaming. I do the test, certain tests. You, okay, I'm definitely dreaming. My body's asleep in bed. Why is this wall solid? I know I'm dreaming. Then I wake up. A week or so later, get lucid again, try it a second time. I go up to the wall, I touch it, it's still solid. I'm thinking, this is insane. I know this wall doesn't exist. But this time, I engaged a contemplation within the dream. I basically talked myself out of it. I said, I know that I'm dreaming and that this wall is empty of inherent existence. It is made of my mind. It is not solid. I can do this. And then I walked through and I was, oh, this is quite cool. I can actually show you. <laughs> and I walked through and I got to about there, right? And I thought, and you can test this too, I thought it was going to be like walking through a cloud. It wasn't. It was like walking through concrete. It was like, oh. if you ever, have you ever stuck your hand in concrete or like... Uh, who would have done that? <laughs> I worked on a building site once when I was a teenager. Imagine putting your hand to really wet sand or something like that. And I was, uh, walked through it like that, 
and it felt a little bit solid, like wet sand. And I had a little freak out. I was like, oh shit, I hope I'm actually dreaming. And then the moment I doubted the empty nature of the wall, it solidified around me. And I was stuck in the wall. I was like, oh, oh, what do I do? What do I do? And I panic and I wake up. Then I started to get what his three word teaching was teaching me. Our habit of seeing a brick wall as solid is so strong that we bring that habit into the illusory dream state with us. And until we contemplate or unravel the falsity of that habit, the wall will continue to be solid. If at any moment you doubt yourself or you doubt the empty, pure potentiality of the wall, it will re-solidify around you. And in the third dream, I got lucid, full of confidence, blah, 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 and I ran through it to the other side. <coughs> he was giving me a brilliant esoteric tantric teaching in those three words. What he was teaching me was that things that seem to be solid are not always so. And that's a revolutionary new habit to install into your mind. Does it mean I can walk through walls in the waking state? Absolutely not. But does it mean the next time I come face to face with the brick wall of my own bullshit, I am more likely to know, aha, this too is not as solid as it seems and can walk through it. The next time I'm confronted by the brick wall of my own fear, phobias, limits, I can think, aha, this too is not as solid as it seems. I can choose to walk through this wall. And you never look at walls the same way again. So these are three, I mean, there are loads of other things here, but just to touch on preparation for death and dying, spiritual practice in your sleep, and exploration of the pure potentiality or the empty, the void nature of reality. So that's pretty, pretty far out stuff um, and very beneficial. And it makes sleep fun. You know, I want you tonight to be excited to go to bed. Most of us go to bed when we're too tired to stay awake. I want you to go to bed because you're so excited to enter the dream state. It should feel almost like it's a date night with your mind. You know, it's like net Netflix and chill. This is like lucid dreaming and chill with your mind. You're like, right, early night, 10 p.m., go to bed, light the candles, incense around the bed, mantras, blah, blah, blah. You can't wait to get in there because it is this relationship. It's almost like that of a lover, you know, with, with that unconscious mind moving in there and really befriending your mind. I have what I call a default dream plan, which is basically if I get lucid spontaneously and I haven't decided what to do, um, I will, as a default, just run around and hug everyone. Because I realize, <laughs> it's funny, because I realize that if, if this dream is all me, right, if everything is my mind, then all the people in the dream are me. And even the chair's me and the floor's me. So I literally run around and hug everyone in the dream. If you do that, you are going to wake up feeling really, really good the next day. And it's not rocket science, because you have given yourself internal psychological hugs all night. So of course you feel more confident. You feel less self-doubt. You feel more unified, less neurotic. So from the profound to the ridiculous, this stuff changes the, changes the way you sleep. To further this, uh, more of the kind of Tibetan view, we'll have a look at these four stages. Now these you find, this is in the dream teachings of Padmasambhava, who was a historical figure, sometimes called Guru Rinpoche, who uh, was the kind of a pioneer of Buddhism into Tibet, set up the first Buddhist monasteries and all this kind of stuff, was also a fully enlightened being, and so you can think of an enlightened archetype. So as both a historical figure and a Buddha, with his own practice and mantra and all this kind of stuff. And historically, he taught on the bardos. Of course, we said one of the bardos is death, so he, uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead was written down by his consort, or you could say his wife, his spiritual wife, um, dictated by him, and then was a terma, which means it was kind of a, like a kind of a time capsule, teaching kind of buried, and then rediscovered at a later date. And not only did he teach on the death and dying states, as well as thousands of other teachings, but also on the dream yoga teachings. So he identified these four stages of dream yoga. Um, so these are the four stages we're going to look at. They're the four stages I know. I know there are other lineages. The Dzogchen lineage will be different. The, the Kagyu lineage is different to this. It's based on the six yogas rather than these teachings. But 
These are the ones I know. Said to be four stages. The first one is recognition. So this is basically recognizing that you're dreaming. So this is learning how to lucid dream. Doing the practices uh, which get you to the point where you go, aha, I'm dreaming. Are the Tibetan practices better than the Western practices and vice versa? Uh, Zogchen Ponlop Rinpoche in his book, Mind Beyond Death, says no. He says, use whatever, whatever practices best suit you to get to the point of recognition. For Westerners, most of the time, those practices are the Western practices. The Tibetan dream yoga practices, you know, some of them require like a PhD in Tibetan iconography to even know what the hell you're doing. You know, you've got to fall asleep visualizing certain things in certain chakras, visualizing yourself in the form of a naked female deity wearing a garland of skulls, while you visualize your guru on your head and another deity in your throat. I don't have a guru. Who's the Vajrayogi? You know, all these questions come up when you deal with Westerners. So although, of course, in the West, we want to learn those esoteric practices and fall asleep in these weird shapes and visualizing these things, to be honest, unless you're a hardcore Buddhist practitioner, most of the time they don't work nearly as well as the uh, Western practices which are things like the practice I mentioned to you, uh, things like you might see me looking at my hands. Anyone notice when I'm looking at my hand? Done it four times so far. When something unexpected happens, yeah. So the bell went, someone dropped something, I forgot a word. Yeah, so what I'm doing is um, something weird happens. So what I do is I say, oh, that's weird. Could I be dreaming? Now, I'm not psychotic. I know I'm not dreaming, but I'm making a habit. And I'm saying, well, could I be dreaming? Let me check. So what I'm doing is I look at my hand, and I, in my head, I'm counting four fingers and a thumb. Then I'll either flip it over, flip it back, or I just look at it, make a fist, and put it back like that. If I do that enough times during the day, eventually I'll dream of doing it, because we dream of what we do in the day. If you spend your whole day packing boxes, that night you're probably going to dream of packing boxes, right? In the dream, things with detailed patterns tend to do weird things if you try and replicate them twice in a row. So if I do that in a dream, Let's say I'm in a dream and something weird happens. Like, oh, that was weird. I'm in the habit of checking my hand. In the dream, probably the hand will change. Like my, I might get an extra finger. I might get no fingers. That nine times out of ten, your hand or any detailed pattern will change if you look at it twice in a row in the pre-lucid dream state. So this is a way to get lucid and stuff like that. Um, again, that's not a Tibetan technique. If you speak to, if you tell Lama Yeshe, Charlie's told me to look at my hand all day, he'll say, Charlie's a little bit crazy. No idea what he's talking about. <laughs> but if you tell him, Rinpoche, Charlie is telling me, um, <laughs> he feels like he's there. Um, Charlie is telling me to, um, every time I experience the dreamlike nature of phenomena, to stop, pause, and ask myself, could this be a dream? So I say, ah, oh, yes, this is dream yoga practice. So uh, there's hardly any of the Western practices that aren't sourced from the Tibetan practices anyway. It's the same mind, just different methods given. Um, but once you get lucid, then we see who's doing the flying about sex and skateboarding Western vibe, and who's doing the dream yoga spiritual practice vibe. So actually, I'd say use whatever techniques to get lucid, to, to get to recognition state. Once you've recognized, then I would advise the following practices. So step two, after you've recognized, it transformation. A bit of a funny um, kind of word they've used here, because it's not about transformation of the dream. It's not saying once you get lucid, turn the cup into a dinosaur. That comes later. It's actually about transformation of fear. So one of the first things it's said to do when you get lucid, rather than doing a meditation, rather than doing something else, is to transform fear. Because fear is such a powerful emotional block in our psychophysical system that until we move through and recapitulate the energy that fear, fear-based paradigms hold within our mind, we will not have the energy to move on to these next stages very clear in these teachings. They say things like, once you're lucid, I love the tiger one, says, once you're lucid, call a tiger into the dream, knowing that it cannot eat you. Um, ride the tiger. No, it says, um, uh, look at the tiger fearlessly. Then, next day, ride the tiger like a horse. And then third one is make friends with the, with the tiger. What, this is basically shadow integration. This is what my new book's about, making friends with your fear, about um, reintegrating the power of fear. Think how high the energy of fear is. <gasps> it's a lot of energy. Look what it's doing to my body and mind. But it's just energy. If we can re-harness that energy and remove the judgment of what's causing it, fear, it's just energy. So actually working through fear is one of the first thing they say. So when I say the spider thing, it's a little bit like this stage. 
Get lucid, do things that scare you. Another Tibetan quote, walk into fire knowing that you cannot be burnt. Jump from a high place knowing that you cannot die. Um, uh, walk into water knowing the water cannot harm. Basically, you can't drown and stuff like that. Do stuff that scares you as a way to integrate your shadows and to regain the energy that fear holds over you. So whatever you're scared of, do it. See if you can work through that fear in a lucid dream. Third one, multiplication. This is kind of what you might think of as transformation. That once you've begun working with fear, the next stage, the next stage is multiplication. This is um, things like walking through the wall. So the walking through the wall example was Lama Yeshe, uh, was um, Akon Rinpoche bringing me to multiplication stage, exploring the empty nature of the dream, which might mean turning the cup, one cup, into like a thousand cups or like looking at somebody and seeing if you can duplicate the character, so making two of the gentlemen in front of me in the dream, or walking through walls, or you know, even putting your hand out and seeing if you can go like, you know, banana, pineapple, uh, grapes, and that's, that's difficult. That's like, I shouldn't say difficult, that's challenging uh, for the dream, because you're asking full manifestation literally at the click of fingers. The reason we're doing this, it might seem a little bit frivolous, but it's not. The motivation is not frivolity. The motivation is not control, it's not ego aggrandizement. Oh look, I can turn one cup into a thousand. Oh look, I can turn this gentleman into many. It's not that. The, the point is the motivation of it, which is it's like dancing with the dream. It's seeing how far you can move in the dance with the dream. Where are the limits? Can you pass through solid objects? Can you make one thing become many? Can you shrink things, grow things? It's actually about explore, exploration of emptiness. It's not, it's not frivolous. If we have the wrong motivation, it can be frivolous. Um, again, before I got into the dream yoga stuff, I reached the multiplication stage uh, just because I was just, I got to that stage not knowing it was in the dream yoga teachings and I was doing it frivolously. So I would get lucid and just to see how much control I had over the dream, I'd get lucid and I would try and turn one side of the dream grayscale and the other color. So, like, just, just for the sake of doing it, and I loved it. My ego, oh, my God, I've mastered it, man. Yeah, I've mastered it. Look, grayscale, color there. Such bullshit. Total bullshit. So you can use lucid dreaming for ego aggrandizement, absolutely. But thank God for what happened next. Whenever I tried to do that, the dream kept shutting me off. Like, it would just wake me up. Now I realize, of course, it was the intelligence of the dream saying, Oi, you're not using this to bloat your ego, dude. Get out of here. It was kicking me out but I kept on going back and kept on trying to just control the dream until eventually this Tibetan woman walks in, like kind of early 60s with long black hair and she walks in while I'm doing the color, the color thing one and she goes, don't control the dream, we don't like it. And I was like, who the hell is we? And where did she come from? You know, I always say 99% of everything in the lucid dream is your mind, but there's a crucial 1%. I think that woman was from, from the 1%. And she was sent there to go, look, young, arrogant man, 19-year-old Charlie, stop doing that. And thank you for the advice. So recognition, transformation of fear, multiplication, kind of exploration of the empty nature of the dream state. And then um, unification. So this would be, in the Tibetan tradition, this would be engaging a spiritual practice where you unify your mind with the enlightened nature of the deity. But I don't think, and this might be incorrect to say it, or God, probably all, everything I've said today is incorrect, guys. Like, go to a llama for the real stuff. But I, 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 I believe this is true. Unification is said to be the moment where you engage a spiritual practice in the lucid dream that leads to a unification with the enlightened mind state within you and within the deity that you're engaging. So from the Buddhist point of view, you'll get lucid, you would start like reciting the Om Mani Padme Hung mantra if you're doing Chenrezig practice, you would visualize Chenrezig Buddha in the sky in front of you, you would then transform your body into Chenrezig Buddha. Once you transform your body and you're engaging the mantra, often the dream will collapse because you've moved out of the limits of the sense of self, the dream will collapse and you might be in what's called the clear light experience behind the dream. Um, and this would be a unification, and that's the kind of ultimate level of, of dream yoga to get to that point. However, I think things like, if you were to do it with the Jesus deity, like when I told that Jesus dream to uh, a Spanish Lama at the Spanish Amazon Center, 
And I said, oh, it went to Jesus, and then it all turned to white light. And she went, oh, like the clear light. And I was like, oh, you think it can be done through Jesus, not just through the Buddhist deities? And she kind of laughed. Like, yeah, you think the Buddhist deities have, like, you know, it's the only way to reach this part? So, whatever. But essentially, in this state, you go into the lucid dream, you engage a spiritual practice where you unify your mind with the enlightened nature of the deity. And that leads to this unification experience where usually the dream will collapse and behind the dream will be this clear light experience, which is the non-dualistic expanse of the mind. And I'm way out of my depth. Um, but yeah, these are the kind of four stages. So recognition we can all learn. Transformation we can all do. Embracing our shadow, working with what scares us in the lucid dream. Multiplication we can do, walk through a wall. Unification, this depends on where we are, what spiritual practices we know how stable we are in the dream. But I would say, if you get lucid tonight and you do a spiritual practice, like you're a Christian uh, or, or you're a Buddhist, I'd say if you want to go straight to this and start doing your, saying your Buddhist prayers or your, your Christian prayers in the dream, I don't think this is a linear process. Don't feel limited by this. If you feel you can go straight to this process, I'd say go for it. Again, I don't know if that's correct instruction, but I know that it's worked for people I've um, instructed to do that. Um, okay, any questions? Yes, you talked about um, dream yoga being a difficult practice and taking a long time and people who do it, they just stick at it. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned yantra yoga. But the thing about vajra dance or yantra yoga is that you can spend years doing it and you can progress gradually mm -hmm. through the levels. You know, you learn the moves and then you mm -hmm. keep doing them and then you have experiences and keep doing them. But with lucid dreaming, I mean, you either have it or you don't. And what do you do when you're in a period when you just don't? Well, if you're talking about like fully lucid dreams, yeah, you're either having fully lucid dreams or you're not. But often there's quite a lot of transition period where you may not be getting like fully lucid, like, oh, right, I'm dreaming, and then I'm going to do my dream plan, meeting my inner child, like full-on lucid dreaming. But you might still be having little lucidity flashes where you get lucid. Like, has anyone had it where you get lucid, then as soon as you know you're lucid, you wake up? Like, I'm dreaming, oh, and then you wake up. You might be having lucidity flashes, you might be having... Um, uh, this is partly why I created this thing, Mindfulness of Dream and Sleep, because of exactly that. Lucid dreaming is, only, is confined to two and a half hours of your sleep cycle where you're dreaming. So even if you lucid dream every night of your life, 95% of your dream experience is non-lucid. So lucid dreaming is never going to be a 100% experience. So I think the mindfulness of dream and sleep approach is wider because we teach things like meditation into sleep called hypnagogic meditation, meditation out of sleep called hypnopompic meditation, uh, dream awareness, which is as close as I get to kind of... Um, dream interpretation stuff, being aware of, of uh, elements of your own dream. There are loads of other dream practices you can do that aren't lucid dreaming. Um, but at the same time, I know quite a few people who within a couple of years get to the stage where they're having one or two lucid dreams a week. And if you're having 50 to 60 full-on dream planned lucid dreams a year, that's, that's enough. You know, that's, that's enough to be really doing this practice. If you think most people go to a yoga class maybe once a week, if you're having a lucid dream once a week, that's still a pretty good average. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a practice to stick with, to progress through. And I think sometimes there are probably much more, many more stages that we miss because it's kind of more intangible than a physical yoga where we can see, oh, I'm progressing through the second set, but I haven't quite got the third set yet. I think there's probably more stages that we don't see because of their, the, the kind of subtle nature of them. I don't know if that answers your question. I was kind of linked to what you were saying. So with the multiplication, you were saying about not it not feeding your ego. So is it about understanding the boundaries of your mind so you can try and break them down or just understanding them so you're aware of them? Hmm. I think once you become aware of them, they might start to break down anyway. Mm -hmm. Almost as if, you know, there's a great quote from Thich Nhat Hanh, the Zen Buddhist master. He says, awareness is like the sun. When it shines on things, they're transformed. So I think actually if you became aware of the limits of the dreaming mind, like with the brick wall thing, just that awareness will naturally start to transform its nature. But I don't know. Good question. Yeah. What do you think of the things like gadgets and things that people help to, uh, to, to get into lucid? Yeah, so there's loads of these gadgets, aren't there? There's yeah, apps and... Yeah. 
These sleep masks you can strap to your face when you fall asleep and they flash red light. They kind of recognize rapid eye movement when your eyes are flicking. And they flash red light. You dream of traffic lights for like two weeks. <laughs> then eventually you're like, oh, the traffic lights, that must be the red lights flashing through. Those can be cool. I used to, when I first started teaching, I, I, like, I used to travel with kind of eight or nine of them and just hand them out. But it's because I was unconfident in my techniques. I just wasn't confident that I could get everyone to the, to, I, I could kind of teach lucid dreaming, so I had all these gadgets. Whereas I haven't used them for years now, because I know that this natural method works if people stick at it. Um, but I think they can be fun. I think they're a bit like stabilizers on a bike. You know, you're like learning to ride, you need your stabilizers. But once you can ride, you take your stabilizers off. Um, lots of apps and stuff like that, things that can track your brain waves as you sleep, reality check apps that in the day they ping and say, like, look at your hand, then you do the check. I think they, you know, if they work, they're great. If you get to the stage where you feel you can only lucid dream when you've got your special sleep mask, that's not good. You know, Tenzin Wangal Rinpoche is quite a well-known Tibetan dream yoga master. He said to me publicly, which is really embarrassing, he said, you won't have your fancy sleep mask in the bardo. And I was like, oh man, serve me publicly. And it's right. You know, if I can only get lucid when I've got these flashing things, what if I die? And I only can get, I can only recognize when the flashing thing is on. So that re it's actually after that comment, I stopped using them. That was about five years ago. Um, but I think it's up to, uh, up to people. I personally, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what these do. You know, in the 50s, people were like, oh, we think smoking might give you lung cancer, but we're not sure. It's like, obviously gives you lung cancer. At the moment, we're like, oh, we think these might be bad for your brain. Having an electromagnet next to your brain, or for men in this area all day, that is not good for two very important parts. Um, so I personally like to have my phone away from my head and on airplane mode um, when I sleep. So I don't know if those apps work on airplane mode. If they do, then I guess that's okay. Yeah. Ben. Can you say a little bit more about the role of doubt in relation to lucid dreaming? You talked about doubt when you're in the lucid dream, mm. but in relation to training, mm. I find that doubt has sort of two opposite effects. Mm. So sometimes I get very doubtful about my ability to lucid dream, and then it makes it more difficult, and I feel very low about it, mm. and I'm less inclined to the techniques. Mm. And that's all very straightforward. But sometimes, I find that if I go to bed really worrying about my ability to lucid dream, mm -hmm. or if I feel doubtful about it during the day, it encourages me to be <laughs> more enthusiastic and to do the techniques more. Mm. And just rather like what you were saying about the mask, I don't want to get into a state where I get lucid primarily or even at all because I've started to doubt myself and that's been, an, that's been a motivating yeah. factor. So it's one of the other things. Great point, that. man. I mean, I guess it depends how you respond to pressure. Like as a former performer, well, still a performer, really, I know, um, I respond well to pressure. So if I'm in a self-doubt mode, if I haven't had a lucid dream for two weeks, I'm like, dude, come on, you need to do this. You need to nail this tonight. I respond very well to that, and I get lucid. So that self-doubt becomes a motivating factor to bring me back onto the path of lucidity. For other people, self-doubt becomes this kind of downward spiral if I can't do it, I'll never be able to do it. I'll never be able to do it, I can't do it. I can't do it, I'm there, and boom, 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 boom. Totally depends. I don't think there's a, a, a kind of a one-size-fits-all for that. Other than I know self-doubt, for most people, myself included, is the biggest obstacle to lucid dreaming, and probably the biggest obstacle to life, to lucid living, is self-doubt. Um, one of the great things about once you're in the lucid dream state, and my fiancé, who's doing... Uh, MA and transpersonal psychology is exploring this at the moment. If she believes there's possibility for lucid dreaming being used in the treatment of depression because it shows you how awesome and how creative and how huge your mind is, which when you're depressed, apparently, you don't feel. But once you get lucid, you see that the mind is creating the trees and the flowers and the, and the, the birds on the trees and the sound of the birds, you know, all this kind of stuff that can be used to kind of um, uh, boost your awareness back into the potential of the human mind. So who knows? But if you're in a depressed state and are doubting your ability to get lucid, maybe you can't get lucid in the first place. I don't know. I don't know. Great question. Is there anything that you can do in, in the daytime to help make it easier? Like, almost like little... Um, you were talking about triggers or something, like to kind of rid your mind so it's not so much pressure in the 
in the do you get yeah, like loads of things. Certain meditation practices you can do, affirmations you say during the day, doing the handshake, uh, med just formal sitting meditation practice. Um, there's an exercise I've got called filling the lucidity tank, where you see what things fill up your lucidity tank and what things drain it. Um, practical things like certain foods and stuff. Um, very practical things like alcohol and weed are the two worst things. So anyone who smokes weed, uh, like marijuana, very bad for your lucid dream practice. It shortens your REM periods and affects your short-term memory that will remember what happened in those REM dreaming periods. So if there's any way to, to get the kids off kind of smoking before bed, teach them lucid dreaming and they'll have to choose one or the other. Um, alcohol too isn't that good. For, I don't drink that much, so I find a homeopathic amount of alcohol, like a glass of wine with my meal, can actually be good. Because I go to by bedtime, I'm, okay, right, had a glass of wine, right, we're going to do this, get lucid. For me, three glasses of wine, I'm gone, and I'm doing no lucid dreaming. So it's working out things like that, what works for you, what doesn't. Um, physical things, like for me, dance like literally physical dancing, I find kind of boosts my lucidity levels. I'm more likely to get lucid that night. Uh, yeah, loads of stuff, loads of techniques. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm a musician and I've got three or four pieces of music that I've managed to remember from dreams that I've had in dreams. So I'd like to remember more lucid dreams, so again, for an hour. But I'm just wondering, do you have any experience of, um, of, of work, kind of experience of going to dreams, particularly around music? Yeah. Just thinking as well, when you read about um, a great song writers, they'll talk about how the song was already there and they were mm. conscious of the air. Mm. It does feel like that when you find out these one of you then experience stuff on to them. The main example I have to give isn't actually music, but it's a woman called Claire Johnson who did a PhD on creative writing through lucid dreaming. So she would go into the lucid dream state and literally call out to the dream, you know, how should I end chapter one? And then, like, let's say she's got this character called John, she would go into the lucid dream and turn herself into the character John to see how does he walk. And then she'd write these amazing descriptions of how John walked and wrote these great novels, well, I think they're great novels, uh, wrote a PhD thesis on how you can use creative writing. I assume that same process could be used for music. I know a friend called Andrew comes to the Dream Forum I mentioned. Uh, he is a pianist, piano teacher and uh, pianist, and he has said trying to play scales in the lucid dream was really difficult, almost as if the mathematical part of the brain wasn't there. If you look at the science, the left brain mathematical part has the least blood flow in a lucid dream, which is why even with full lucidity, trying to do a multiplication is quite a task. You really feel your brain struggling to do it. Um, but he's found freestyle, like, you know, uh, kind of improvisation is really great in the loose dream, almost as if he's more creative. Again, you look at the brain, the creative centers have increased blood flow. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, I think it's a place you can, you can train and, and practice and, and write music. Yeah. One more question, then we're done. Yes. Could you say something else about um, the difference between lucid dreams and out-of-body experiences, both in the Tibetan, uh, in Tibetan theories and also in uh, Tibetan theories? Great last question. We'll be here for another hour. <laughs> no, great question. Yes, let's touch on it. Um, okay, so we can define an outer body experience, from Western point of view anyway, as the experience of the subjective sense of self dislocating from the physical body and, ex and experiencing either a mental duplicate of waking reality or possibly waking reality itself. And they've done tests on this where people go out and they put numbers written on high ledges and they have to go out, out their body and then see the numbers and come back. And uh, the, the studies, there are studies that absolutely prove that's possible and yet the outer body experience is not a scientifically verified fact because there haven't been peer reviewed, there haven't been enough people doing the studies and stuff, it's only a matter of time. Um, so there are lucid dreams which are happening inside your personal psychology inside your personal psyche, and then there's the outer body experience, which is the sense of self, or whatever you want to call it, the consciousness, kind of shifting out of the physical body, and then in the classic one, looking back, and you see your body, and then you can kind of float around your room as a point of awareness and stuff. What I would say, guys, if you have an outer body experience, don't stay in your bedroom. This is nuts. People spend ages doing all these trainings, have an outer body experience. They shift out, and they go, oh, there's my body. Oh, here's my bedroom. Yeah, it looks exactly like it does in real life. What the hell? Get out of your bedroom. Like, go to the moon. <laughs> go to other dimensions of reality. Go and visit Namke Norba Rinpoche. Don't stay in your bedroom. It's crazy, isn't it? 
we don't think of that though. It's crazy. Say, get out of your bedroom. People don't want to leave their bedroom because of all this rubbish, fear, fear based rubbish around the, the silver cord and all this kind of stuff. It's like you're beyond the time space continuum once you're in an OB. So being in your bedroom and being on, on Mars is the same distance. You know, we're beyond the time space here, so it makes no difference. Um, that's kind of how it's viewed in, in uh, the West. In the Tibetan tradition, it's funny, it's not, the OBE work is still classed as dream yoga, because of course, this is a dream. The dream we have at night is actually in some cases called the secondary dream. This is the primary dream, the shared dream of waking life. And then we have a dream within a dream when we go to sleep. So outer body work, which is where you shift out and explore this dream of waking life, is still kind of dream. Um, when I've spoken to Lama Yeshe about this, he said things like, uh, lucid dream in head, now go out of head. And this was his description of kind of the, the outer body experience. You get terms like the special dream body, used to describe the difference between the dream body you have in a lucid dream and the special dream body which can leave the confines of your personal dream experience and explore reality and other realms of existence, which is like the description of what in the West would call this outer body experience. Um, and there are things like I remember Akon Rinpoche saying, when you go out, uh, leave your bedroom, go down the street uh, when you're in the outer body state, see the numbers on the doors. The next day, take a pen and pad and go and check if the numbers are correct. Um, so, he, so in the Tibetan tradition, it's absolutely about validating it. It's not about saying they're the same. It's that one is, is an actual experience about a body, one is a loose dream, and you should be able to tell the difference. Um, so yeah, I hope that helps.